Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Louis Monnier, and I have the pleasure to introduce um, a group of people from Sweden, uh, from the gapminder.org site. And um, so we have Ulla, who's going to give a talk, Johan, and Anna here. And uh, I had the pleasure of seeing another person, Hans uh, Rosling, from uh, Gapminder, but a couple of weeks ago at this TED conference, where all sort of fancy people such as, you know, uh, Larry, Sergey, Marisa, a few other people from Google go. And uh, this presentation was just a blast. I mean, to give you an idea, Al Gore spoke as well, and there were people who, in their slides after that, had uh, Gore rustling in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Ula is going to try to give at least as good a presentation, and uh, I will let him go. Okay. Thank you for letting me speak here. I will kickstart this. Uh, Gapminder is a non-profit Swedish foundation with the ultimate goal to increase use and understanding of international statistics or actually development, but that would be understood by statistics. I'm gonna kickstart and write show a lot of stuff because the method we have is not talk, 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 but to visualize data, okay? I'm gonna like jump between a lot of softwares. So, can we turn the light down, is there a way? To get it more cozy, no? Okay, anyway. Uh, this is the world as we recognize it, you know, the environmental uh, movement use it a lot to show that we have one little planet, we have to be very careful with it, you know, take it easy, we shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. Okay, so they show this image, I mean, it's a representation of the world, isn't it? And all of us, it's invoke feelings and we get these emotions, you know, that, yeah, maybe I shouldn't drive the car as much as it. Okay. Here is another uh, way of showing information to audiences. It's a very common way that we see, at least at universities, trying to like play the, the smart guy, saying it went from 5.5 .5 to 2.9. That's a lot. We have to be careful. Okay. <laughs> People don't understand anything, okay? But we pretend. We say, yeah, I feel a lot, or yeah, that's interesting. So what alternatives would there be? Yeah, then we have these stuff on TV, a lot of it, you know? This uh, bald university. Hi, <laughs> who are these guys? <laughs> anyway, this, this is the professor, you know, sitting in front of his books. He read a lot of books, so we better trust the guy. And he's smiling, so he's probably a nice guy. Uh, he will tell the government what to do and now is in TV. And then we have this alternative vision of some, I mean, I'm talking about international development. This is a very common image showing a child now in school, happy and so on. So this is probably a good project they are talking about. This is National Geographic, you know? Interesting, exotic people. Look at the hole in her air there and they're almost naked, living close to nature. I mean, she painted her breast. What is that? How fascinating people are in other countries, aren't they? You know, here in our rich countries, we are so boring and uh, fed up with capitalism, but they, they are more real. I mean, we are unreal, okay? <laughs> this is another one, you know, with this cool white male fighting dangerous animals or people. Very simple setup, and we, are there any white males here today? There's plenty of them. Did you see this? Did you identify with this being uh, Tarzan? Okay. These are common images from abroad or from poor countries. Or call it whatever. I mean, the giraffe Elizabeth. Isn't she cute? She's so cute. But in the background, in the forest, you can see those very dangerous hunters killing the giraffe Elizabeth. Those guys, they don't have any names. They are just evil, you know? But the, this European woman, academic, she goes there and she saves the animals. So she's the good one, you know? My kid is now one year old. In five years from now, he have, will be feeded with a lot of these images. And it will definitely form the way he looks upon the world. That there are poor uh, animals out there that needs to be rescued. Otherwise, they will be killed by evil Africans or something like that. Okay, this is an alternative. Robert Redford falls in love, the sun sets, and it's just beautiful. 
This is the crisis. We see a lot of this. All these images I'm showing are exceptions. I mean, this is an extraordinary event. It happens, but uh, as soon as there is something negative to report, we will see it. Uh, this is a positive thing, but as exceptional. I mean, the paradise, those countries have nice palm trees and we can go there surfing. I mean, these are the images we see from poor countries. Are they representative? Or are they all just very biased, extremely events that actually form how we see the rest of the world where we didn't travel and so on? I think so. There need to be an alternative image and it needs to be fact-based and it should in some sense represent the common life and the com everyday life, not those extraordinary strange fantasies of ours. So we try to do this kind of stuff. I will show you some demos. Let's start with this one, which is called Dollar Street. So I have to get rid of this stuff. Okay, imagine everybody in the world living on one long street, okay? The poorest to the left and the richest to the right. So this would be the poorest family in a refugee camp somewhere. And this would be, well, who is the richest one right now? living up here. And all of us, the rest of us, we live in between. The people in this room probably up here in this corner. I mean, Sweden would be here. Okay, can we, can we understand the world in one dimension? What would it look like? Uh, we made this as a, sh a game for children where you like browse the dollar street. Uh, because if we say this is for growing up, they don't want to look because they say, well, I read books about income inequality. I don't have to look at photos. But when we say it's for children, they spend two hours looking at it, and they learn a lot. So let's pick some houses. Let's pick this rich South African family with a swimming pool. Okay, we go down the street, we pick another family. Let's take, for example, this one. A bigamist Muslim family in Uganda. Look here, these guys have $100 per day. These have 2 to $5 per day or 10, it's very tricky to measure income, but more or less, we just approximately measured it. This would be a third family with somewhere around $1 a day. So there is a clay walls, those are brick walls, and this is a swimming pool. Okay, so there are levels. What is poverty? Who is poor? I mean, anybody you ask here will say, I'm poor, I could need a bigger swimming pool. You see, the world is unequal. I mean, some people live with enormous, re uh, uh, with enormous resources uh, like us, but still there are people that are even richer. That's unequal. Okay, so how can we get an overview that really represents how the world is? Okay, let's start by looking at household. We go even further down. This would be a widow in Uganda. This woman, has one nice dress, she put it on for this photo. We can enter her, this is the environment. She lives where the water comes up and it's, it's really not a healthy place to live. With two of her children sleeping in this, well, there is no light, so it was very difficult to take these photos. Anna is the photographer. This would be her bed where she sleeps with two kids and they have some plastic equipment which is very good for health because you can clean them easily. This is her living room. Okay, oh, please observe, there are no emotions in my voice. Technical description of living condition to understand, because we, all of us, we grew up, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, at the top of Dollar Street, okay? And at the very extreme top. And then we go out in the world to save the world, but we don't know nothing about the world, you know? We haven't been there. We haven't experienced the kind of decisions that 80% of the world population are up to every day to get food. So we are not the experts. Okay. So we have to learn a lot. Let's check how the doors look at different places. Let's check how the kitchen looks like. Okay. So this would be a kitchen in the middle of Dollar Street. You see there, it's under the roof. She don't get a lot of rain. And there is a brick wall, quite a good kitchen. All right. These are just images as well. So where is the data and where are the facts? Let me try to go over to the facts now. And how could we combine photos uh, with 
with numbers. This is a um, thing we did for the Human Development Report that UNDP publish every year about the general development on Earth. Let me just take away those high text boxes. And please, if you have any questions, don't interrupt, because this is going to go fast. Dollar Street, this is the same Dollar Street. You have dollars per day, one ten hundred. This guy has ten dollars per day. There are six billion people on Earth. Let's drop them down on Dollar Street and see where they live. We hear a lot about the gap between rich and poor increasing. Whoa. Would that be me? So here are the six billion people. I just <laughs> spread them out. They have a nice ceiling with good light, windows, and they seem to be happy. They are laughing. <laughs> and this guy is the richest guy on earth. Okay, so. Great. So we see the rich people and the poor people. The gap between those two are, is increasing. The problem is I can't see any gap. There is no gap. There is like a continuous mountain stuff. There is not two groups. But we simplify in our minds and think about poor and rich. Because it's easier to think in those terms. But it's a continuous scale. People live on all income levels. And everybody would say they are poor if you ask them. Most people would. Uh, so how are we going to understand this better? Let's see how this thing changes. No, let's start with this. The total income in the world, how is it distributed in terms of the 20% richest, this would be the rich people. They have 74, or I should actually say we, we have 74% of the world total income. The poorest 20%, they share 2% of the total income. Okay? This, this is what we deal with. When we have a common environment on Earth, this is where we say these people should think about the environment, but they think about getting food, and that's very, it's a very simple setup, so. Let's see, poverty line. UN have this official poverty line, one dollar per day. Uh, let's go back in time to 1970 and see actually 38% of the world population were below one dollar a day. These are adjusted for changes in prices and so on to make sense. Let's see how it changed. Year by year, we move forward. In the 80s, let's move forward. We can see how this mountain is growing because more people on Earth. In 1990, 26% had less than $1 per day. Then we move forward even further and we see how the world gets richer. Do you see a gap between rich and uh, poor increasing? I don't. But I see a general tendency, people getting richer all over the place. Now, I want to move forward to see how this is distributed in different regions. This would be, sub uh, this would be Africa, where actually 66% of the world population is below the poverty line in, in year 2000. The rich countries, OECD, the, uh, the club of the rich, I mean, nobody is actually, no whole percent is below the poverty line. Latin America is very wide. It reaches from the poorest to the richest. There are people on all income levels. The same goes for Eastern Europe. Then we have the Chinese region with its neighboring countries, East Asia, and the Indian group with 23% below the poverty line. Let's move forward and zoom in on the poor. So this is in 1970. The poor people were mostly in Asia because it's so big population groups. 11% of all poor lived in Africa. 56% in the part where China is, East Asia, and 13 the Indian group. Then an enormous economic growth have brought a lot of people out of poverty. Let me just stop to say if this data is relevant, because of course there is an uncertainty in this data, and that's where we really want to go in, in terms of academic research in the end, to say what are the uncertainties and so on. But we try to start f first by using the data and get it understood, then the criticism will increase, and then we will get better data in the future. That was just a, f a, s a small lapses. Okay. Now, in year 2000, it's almost one-third in each of these groups. If the projections for the future are right, actually in 2015, 68% of the world's poor will be Africans. 
So it's a totally different distribution of poverty on Earth. Um, now I would just like to jump over to show different thing. Uh, sort of. Yeah. Let me just show you where you where China is in 1970. If we did this not for regions but for for a country, China would be here. And let's add USA. There is US. It's much smaller. This is in 1970. Uh, US is richer than China. China is perfectly equal. Everybody is poor. Okay. So what happened? They got richer. We know that China got richer. Let's move forward year by year and see how it changes. We can see how people get richer and richer, and this red ghost will soon cover US. Let me do it again, yeah? This is what happened. <laughs> Scary, isn't it? OK, so there is your market in the future, obviously. OK, let's skip that part. I will try to like focus on US as much as I can. OK? Uh, brief for one second and check where I am. OK, so let's go back to this image showing the regions. Dollars per day, what is that? How can you measure it? It's tricky, but it's actually more or less the same thing as GDP per capita. More or less, I mean, you can compare them. So what we did here is that now we go over to regional averages of GDP per capita. And you learn by looking at this image how different the distribution is compared to just looking at the average number. Because those uh, balls will end up on their regional averages. And you don't see the distribution within the regions. We have sub-Saharan Africa now also. So here it appears to be a gap, a very clear gap between OECD countries and the rest. But when we saw the distributions, we can see that in terms of personal income, it doesn't make sense. This is too simplistic. I mean, you are too smart to look at one dimensional world. The world is multidimensional. How can we add dimensions? Well, this was now money. Let's add health in terms of child survival. How many children, how, the percentage of children surviving to age five among all born? In the rich OECD, we can see, oh yeah, this is that health is bad and good. It's the simple way to put it, okay? Uh, north and south on this map would mean healthy and unhealthy. Uh, let me see right now. East and west would be rich and poor, okay? That's a simplistic. That you can explain to anybody. Sub-Saharan Africa, 82% of the children survive to age five. In the rich countries, 99.4, it says. OK. Let's see how these changed. Actually, in 1975, the two Asian groups were poorer than Africa, both of them. Then this economic growth we can now see how they leave this where they were in 1970. Africa doesn't really move, Sub-Saharan Africa. While the two Asian regions move quite a lot and the world is changing. Well, let's try to go beyond these regional averages. Africa is not a homogeneous place as we might think. We split the African subcontinent, Sub-Saharan Africa, into countries. And it reaches from Sierra Leone where 70% of the children survived to age five, up to Mauritius, almost on 98%. It's a huge difference, and we can see African countries on all different levels. Let's continue splitting the rest. This is the Indian group, that's why India is very close to the big average, but it reaches from Afghanistan to Sri Lanka. Arab states is not at all a homogeneous group. It's very, very, very different. I mean, to reach that kind of child survival, you need social security systems, very advanced societies. East Asia and the Pacific. Also, a wide distribution. Actually, in all these groups, we will see a big distribution. Central and Eastern Europe. 
they cover the whole world. It just doesn't make sense to look by geographic region because the countries are so different. I will later split countries as well to show you that even the distribution within countries are so wide. So this collection of national uh, averages that is being done by UN really doesn't show the right picture. But let's continue here. We have Chile to Haiti, an enormous difference between those two Latin American countries. High income OECD, oh, well, it's by definition rich and healthy, sort of. But US, we come from Sweden. <laughs> okay. If, if you want to have some help, we can tell you how to do this. Both the visual stuff and the child survival. How do you make children survive? We know. Okay, we are the world champions. That's why we do these charts, you know. Uh, yeah, let's, let's uh, just dig through this to see what we are seeing. We don't only have poor and rich. There are countries all over the place. Okay, let's see. There is also a strong correlation. I see 30% uh, uh, to 0.3% difference in child survival and 500 to 50,000 difference in GDP per capita. We have like two zeros on each of these axes. So the differences is, are huge in the world. These are, of course, logarithmic scales. Let's look at some countries. Niger ends up there. But on the same economic level as Niger, Eritrea is. Why are they performing much better in health? Well, I don't have the answer. That's where you can find answers in, in the literature. This is giving you the framework to spot where are countries in the general overview. India have the same income as Vietnam, but Vietnam is much more healthier. It's also smaller. South Africa is much richer than Vietnam. Why do they perform so much worse in health? Health, I say all the time, child survival is here considered a general health measurement. By UNICEF, they say that is the way to measure health in the society because children die of so many different reasons. The size of the bubbles is, of course, due to population, I forgot to tell. Okay, so we have Malaysia and United States with a difference of $9,000 in Malaysian GDP per capita, 40000 in US, but you perform equal in child survival. So this is kind of a world map to, to see where countries are. Singapore and Sweden are, are performing better. Okay, so we have a strong correlation between money and health, but at the same time we can spot the outliers. So it's like, like a map. Let's move forward and look at differences within countries. Let's take Bangladesh as an example. It would make a lot of sense to have D disaggregated data, for example, for income groups. The poorest 20% are quite far from the Bangladesh average. Now we extract the 20 richest percent and we can have all those, we can see reaching from Eritrea to Egypt. Let's look at all the five quintiles, I mean 20% in each of them, and that is where Bangladesh would be. India also, we can see that the difference between Bangladesh and India is smaller than the difference within these countries. Let's look at some other examples. For example, Peru. There the income difference is enormous from the poorest living close to the Eritrean average and the richest where Hungary is. Of course, there's a lot of tension in these societies. Let's compare it to Guatemala. Quite similar, but the rich people there don't get as healthy. South Africa is a special place, of course. The rich people, they should be up at least on the US level, shouldn't they, with this money? Of some reason, I mean diseases, uh, car accidents, etc. they get affected by these poor people living in the same cities. Those are my evaluations. Those are not in the data, of course. Vietnam has the same health as the richest South African. All the five income groups of Vietnam are healthier than the South African averages, even if they are poorer. So yeah, there is a connection between health and income, but etc. Okay, we could go on for one hour. Let's try to jump over to something completely the same, but a bit different. Okay, this we did with human development 
uh, report earlier, here are the big country, the, the English, French, Swedish, Norwegian, and this, you can select can languages there. Um, I wouldn't do it in Swedish because you would lose it. This is a different approach to show the same thing, more or less, but in, it's a difference. I have life expectancy now on this axis, not child survival. The average of the world would be there in 1975. Since 1975, this is just a very clear <laughs> thing I want to say, the world has become richer and healthier on average. But we don't hear much about that because you can't make news out of it. So now we are both healthier and richer. Now I would do the same thing a little bit faster just to show you that we have the same kind of distributions in life expectancy just to reach this image. Okay, so here we have how long is your life and how rich are you? You see, there is no gap between the richest and the poorest in this kind of images. I wanted to use this to tell a story about one country uh, in particular. I pick Botswana. It's in Norwegian, you say? Ah, sorry. It was all the time. It's a bit of a problem. Now, this would be English, wouldn't it? Botswana and Costa Rica. Okay, so let's see two case studies. Botswana and Costa Rica, both are so-called success stories in development. UN and World Bank say to the African countries already in the 70s, look at Botswana, that's how you should do it. That's how to do it. How are they doing? Well, let's copy the thing. I mean, because they get richer and healthier by every year. And within tw this stops now in 1990. Within, say, 20 years, they will be in the OECDs if they just continue like that. This is what happened. So in 10 years, due to HIV AIDS, they lost life expectancy more than they have gained in the earlier 30 years. And the obvious question is, where will it end? Where will it go? Will it go back there? Will it go up there? Well, let's take it again. The economist in the Swedish newspaper said, well, no big deal, you know. They are still having economic growth. They are still moving to the right. So if you only look at economy, you wouldn't see this, you wouldn't see the problem, I mean. Okay, let's move to an example of a sub-national data set, China. You have heard about China, yeah? It's a very big country, and Mao Zedong was the boss for some time. He said, we don't need money, okay? My interpretations, okay, no official statements, but the, <coughs> that's sort of what he said. We only need health and welfare. So he said, let's aim for that corner. So he goes up there and then he dies. And Deng Xiaoping takes over and turns to the right. <laughs> That's what happened. Now China is an ordinary place on earth. I mean, in the middle, okay? Uh, people from China here, you recognize this, yeah. Okay, so uh, what, what about the differences within China? Here we collected Chinese data. Now we split China into regions. And those are bigger than Sweden, all of them. But we don't know the names of them, unfortunately. So this should, of course, be in the UN data set or the Google data set or whatever. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to compare the richest region in China with the poorest. See that if we can trust this data, it actually shows up on more or less the same health compared to the rest of the world. There is no Chinese region down here. They are all on a very high health level. So, now I want to show you as much as possible, you know. This is a different software we made some years earlier. Demo, I should say. Let's pick the, the winner here, okay? Sweden, ah, almost winner in this one. It depends on the data, okay. So there is where we have Sweden. Now I'm actually back on child survival on this axis. And this time it's expressed in thousands. But anyway, it's the same thing. Rich, poor, healthy, unhealthy. Let's move back in time some hundred years. Oh, this is where Sweden was. <laughs> when I was not around. <laughs> so let's, let's have a look at it. What does it mean, actually? We are comparing GDP per capita from... In the background, we have all the countries of today. 
but Sweden is 100 years back. So we can compare the historic data of Sweden with the world of today. And then the, the neighboring country of Sweden 100 years ago today would be Angola. So Angola today and Sweden 100 years ago end up on the same GDP per capita and child survival. Then all other aspects, like literacy rate is very different between the two. So these are only two dimensions. Let's see the way, which way did Sweden go to end up in that corner? We have leftish countries on the left and rightish on the right. It's quite easy. So is Swedish a leftish or a rightish? Actually, we have this Swedish model of combining the two. Five years at the time, before the First World War, there is the First World War, we, wasn't, we were not in it. Between the two wars, we have the record uh, years, no, actually, uh, the Happy Twenties, it's called. Then it stopped, the economic growth stopped, and we had the Swedish Mao Zedong called Per Albin Hansson, increasing health without more money, okay? He didn't die, but there was a change in government, and after the war, we had the record years, and we improved money and health with uh, unseen pace, ending up in this corner of the world. This is when we started to write books about society planning and stuff. We got so proud, you know? <laughs> if I should tell you the truth, we negotiated with Hitler. That is why we stayed outside the war, and after the war we were like the only functioning country in Europe. Yep? It wasn't a question, it was a statement. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I, uh, let's continue, okay? So this is the Swedish model then. Let's compare it to Japan. And we have this race now between the red uh, Toyota and the blue Volvo, okay? <laughs> so, in 1920, which car would you choose? Okay? Of course, th there was no cars. But, but anyway, uh, the, the Volvo is super. You see, it's, it's richer and healthier. And then during the World War, I mean, Japan lose a lot of money. Surprisingly, not health. But what happens after the war is really scary. Because these Toyota guys, they invent some kind of engine. They run the double speed as the Volvo. And they catch up with us. You see, we turn left to get better health. And they catch up in health. And then in the 80s, 90s, they catch up in economy. And now they are both richer and healthier than us. And we don't know how they did it. We have this perfect Volvo running, and now we buy Toyotas. <laughs> the worst thing is that they are running in this Swedish model, combining economic growth and social welfare. That should be a Swedish model, not a Japanese model, okay? Let's take a look at some other things here. It's important to see we don't have any countries down there. No so rich country is this unhealthy. Actually, there is no country up there. Cuba should be there, but World Bank didn't put it in the data set this year. They don't want to deal with their uh, income. But it should be up there. But if not, we have this strong correlation. So please remember after seeing it that there are countries on all levels of income and health. There is a big mess of it. And if you want to learn it, you will have to learn each case and each story. I mean, there is a tendency. Richer countries are healthier, but also a difference. So now, what, what should I go for? Yeah, actually, I could. I would like to, to change now a little bit to what was in the presentation. Uh, to show Iran. Ne, ne, ne. Oh, yeah, you're right. I want to sh show you some features. <laughs> so let's move to the map. This would be the map you recognize with east, west, north, south. Does it make sense to look at data on this map? Can you see a lot of stuff? Actually, if I should just visualize data analysis here, you lose x and y in geographical coordinates. Those two, X and Y, are the two most efficient visual properties to communicate data. That's why ma maps are only good for some purposes, especially if you're looking at geographic uh, distribution of problems. Then maps makes a lot of sense. But when we look over time, I mean, South Africa will always be exactly there, and we won't see any change, so we can only use color or size. It's actually why we don't use as much maps to show these stories. Okay, that was a technical thing. Uh, let's pick two countries. You have heard of USA and Mexico, yeah? This is how they show up on the world map, very close to each other. Let's go back to this other socioeconomic map. 
This is kind of a big jump. If you go from Mexico to United States, it's quite big. I could pick another example also. For example, we have this. I'm, I'm just proud of this feature, that's why I'm showing it. Oh, not that proud because I can't pick Dominican Republic. Yeah, there it is. Haiti and Dominican Republic. There is very big difference. If you just get over the border, you will end up in a much richer and much healthier countries. So we should kind of morph between all different graph uh, types that exist. That is sort of a future thing to do. Let's now jump over to something different. This tool is, I don't know, what you see is what you get. But you, you click on stuff and compared to other shortings tool, when you say, I want to make a nice little diagram. OK, what type? Pie chart, new screen. And what should be the labels, new screen, and you sort of get bored in screen number three. So there are no screens here. You actually play around with it. I click on the axis, I get a pop-up, and I change. So let's move over to, on the y-axis, we have total fertility rate. What does it mean? It's the number of children per woman. Okay, so we have one child per woman, and for example, Italy, almost one. And then in some countries, eight children per woman. We have a different map now. Um, let's go back in time and look at this map. In 1960, there are two types of countries, industrialized and developing countries. It makes sense to group the world in two groups. That was in 1960s. This is where the grouping doesn't make sense anymore, because family planning may these countries rain down all over the place. The number of children is decreasing. Can you see in the 80s, 90s? An enormous use of contraceptives on Earth to stop the population explosion. Let me play it again. We go back to 1950. The division between rich and poor, or whatever you call them, disappears as it gets filled by countries dropping down from below. And now a lot of countries have already reduced number of children from, say, seven down to four. If this continues for another 30 years, there will be no population explosion. Yep. Yeah, okay, so let's put life expectancy there. Would that make sense? Because that's the other thing I want to show. I will do that after showing Iran. That's exactly the kind of tool. I click on the x-axis, I combine it with something else. The expert statisticians sort of, yeah, they like this tool, but they get afraid of it because what are they supposed to do if people can just browse the data? Okay, so they say it's dangerous because it's too simplistic. But because actually people get ideas, probably you had some idea of what you want to compare. So you eyeball the data, you have your sort of ideas and you can test them immediately. People will come up with a lot of stupid ideas. Yeah. Let me show you Iran, which in 1960, oh, way beyond, uh, before I was born, you know, back in the Middle Ages almost, it was up there on a level of seven children per woman, 3,000 in GDP per capita. Let's turn on this trails function. So this is not a PowerPoint. I'm playing with the tool right now. Okay, here is the revolution, you know, the mullahs took over and they said, well, mm, family planning, no, we actually don't talk about sex. Now, yeah, that's, that's my words. They went backwards, they lost money and they increased number of children. Then something extraordinary happened. The mullahs, one night, they changed their mind. They said, well, uh, <clears throat> family planning is quite good for economic growth. Let's uh, invest in the biggest condom factory on Earth, and let's uh, have these courses. Uh, I mean, in 15 years, they drop from seven to less than three. They are now down there. Yeah, you heard about this in the news, didn't you? You didn't? You didn't. It doesn't fit the, the journalist's agenda, you know, to tell this story. They have a very simplistic image of Iran, confusing it with Iraq. Those are very, very, very different countries. <laughs> Sensitive issue, but it makes sense to look at the drop that Iran performed with a very carefully planned, uh, systematic family planning. You are not allowed to marry in Iran without the boy and the girl taking the course on how to use condoms by law. Okay, that's how they did it. 
And of course you reduce it, because a lot of people don't want to have that much children. And yes, you have to talk about sex to be able to drop like that. So obviously they talk a lot about sex. So obviously we don't understand them. I don't know, who are we, who are them? Anyway, let's move on. You wanted to change the axis, on the, uh, the thing on the x-axis. I click the x-axis, I choose, I actually want to show this with life expectancy instead. So now we are, let me, t I, it shouldn't be on logarithmic, so I changed to linear. And it morphs over, it shouldn't blink, it should morph, remember that. It should really smooth stuff, that's where people say, wow. Okay? Okay, we go back. So what are we looking at? Now we don't have money. This is only social indicators. Long life, short life. A lot of children, few children. 1960. Also these two groups. Long life, small families. Short life, big families. Then what happened? Yeah, we can see a similar change. Remember that things were moving a lot when I showed data from the 1960s. Remember, they don't have to remember the exact movement. The world has changed. It is changing today, and in 20 years you have to update. I don't know, we need some kind of tool to search this data to constantly update our knowledge, because it doesn't make sense to go to university in the 60s and then think you know everything. You need to constantly update it. Some kind of feed, maybe, I don't know. Okay, so here we have the world today. Let's pick two countries. Let's go back in 1970. What would this country be? Well, I'm looking for a particular one here. Sorry. This is the one. Uh, it's sort of embarrassing to see me where I'm looking right now, but I'm sort of tired. I have to pick it from here instead. This would be, there are two ways of picking countries. Either you look at this and ask yourself, what is this? Then you must point at it. That's one way. I mean, what is this? Where is my country? Then you wouldn't go for, like, pointing at all the 200. So then you need some kind of search. Okay, so let's pick Vietnam. And now we have, in 1960s, USA and Vietnam. Two very, very different countries in terms of long life and size of the family. You can see the fertility drop in US, Vietnam, life getting longer and longer. Now we are in 1975. This is what happened to Vietnam since 1975. A big change. And they are down here now where you were in the 70s where U.S. was, in terms of the size of the family and how long you can expect to live. It's a completely new society. Children born in Vietnam today have the same expectations as U.S. in the 70s. Okay, so where should I go from here? Yep. Can you grab account for, for the Iran? Can you account for the Iran-Iraq war that killed millions? Uh, yeah, you could. We, Iraq uh, lacks a lot of income data and stuff, and, and the UN has this, you know, filtering of data quality. So uh, I don't have it in this. We could look at it afterwards. It, it makes sense. This is the kind of things we, we should be doing and looking at. Uh, let me now jump over to a sort of overview. The flower PowerPoint, it's called. Okay, so what is Gapminder doing and what do we think is needed? There is like one terabyte of public data, more or less, in UN system, national statistics, NGOs like Amnesty and others. They collect a lot of data, it's extremely expensive. This data, this is the scenario that interpreters, journalists, activists and so on, should try to reach an audience through some kind of media. Internet sees this and it widens and it gets a big publicity. Thing is that this doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. People don't see these things. What I showed you were official UN data on their website. You didn't go there and look for it. So how can we change this? Because we need data instead of these myths I was showing in the beginning. People think this is too boring looking at data, and these media, I mean, a journalist putting it up on a web, it's too difficult. 
and expensive. Actually, you have to buy this data. Let me tell you that one of these data boxes is uh, the, the commodity trade in the world, like 6,000 commodities, something like that, 200 countries, import, export, price, quantity, since 1960, the database exists. It already exists, it's already collected. It's being used, and the World Bank and the UN and the OECD are selling this database to companies. But it was produced by tax money and now they are selling it. it it's a very, very, very few companies. That's, one year ago it was 12 companies. It's so sad because we need this data to see the pineapple trade in the world, where does it go, etc. A lot of people should use this information. It's the basic of capitalism, free access to prices. And they have the data. They just don't have the tool or the way to disseminate it. Okay, let's move on. So the data is hidden underground. And here is the public watching the internet. Each ray should hit their own website with their interests customized for them. So these agencies put up small little websites like that connected to their databases. A lot of cumbersome work. Then they want to get paid, so they put a little price tag and the password and the username. And if you pay and remember your password, this is what you get. And then you do something else. I mean, <laughs> who would continue from there? It's really boring. So how can we change it? The data databases exist in multiple formats, etc. A lot of formats. There is a lot of creativity in this business. So design tools also exist. Even more creativity, I would say, but in a better sense. PowerPoint freehand, you have all of them. Flash, Illustrator. And there are skilled people knowing how to deal with these tools. It's, it's just that those guys don't, and girls, they didn't go to the statistic course, so they don't know about data. So they don't manage to get the data into their design tools. That's sort of, how are we going to deal with that? For them to customize the graphic output. So we need to link the data to existing design tools. That's, that's kind of the thing. The tool we are missing is the one linking those worlds together. And then Gapminder is now developing, this is a standalone thing that could be downloaded and run in Africa where there is no internet. This would be a, a open source stuff connected to one database. And then we link a lot of databases together in a search thing. Those are, I can show you some, uh, some examples of it. Then in the future, we hope to inspire others or something. I don't think we, we are the ones to scale this up, but we could, uh, get a competition going so that the, the general behavior with statistics is changed, sort of. So this happened. The weather forecast every day, you know, every evening in the news. I mean, it's all the time. Nice graphics. They have data. Humidity, wind. They don't show these numbers. They would never do that. They get a lot of publicity with their weather forecast, yes, by uh, drawing nice suns, beautiful colors. So these are the guys to copy in social science, sort of. And then this needs to be free, number one. These guys should say, aha, I didn't know that about Iran. Let's uh, write an article about it. So these guys say, wow, that's what we need. So this is what we are doing now to enable the journalists or the interpreters to access the data. There are like multi-levels of users, so to say. We need tools on all levels. Uh, you search and you find life expectancy for Botswana. I would like to immediately see. Uh, this is the first draft. It took me like one hour to draw this image. It's just an image. We don't have this system running right now. Uh, but thumbnails already there. It should be thumbnails of the charts. And we should pick the good charts to represent this data. I mean, there is a Botswana map. It really fits the Botswana data. Uh, and if you click on one of them, you would get this population pyramid. Um, and let me jump over to what Yuan did last week. This is sort of the end of, of my presentation. I have two more things to show, then I will be quiet for some minutes. Shorts. It should be here somewhere, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's this one. This isn't, uh, isn't optimized. It took one week for them to put together. So it's, this is the kind of thing we need. and, and uh, this would be the Swedish population of one particular city. It should be cl two clicks from the search, click the pyramid, and I see the population of my city. 
Okay, so we move over time. And we see how people get older. Here we have a lot of immigration in this age. You can look at those. I go back in time, 1990. I can go back and forth like this and see the overview. It's not interesting just to find one data point saying male, 33 years old, how many are they? It doesn't make sense. I don't want to find one data point. I want to find it in its context. That's when it makes sense. And being able to browse back and forth like that. Uh, so, what about short formats? Actually, there needs to be something, so the end graphic designers, once again, this is like Internet Users World Map 2015, you see your markets there. And uh, let me go forward. This could be also linked, I mean, over time. We need to have this kind of stuff. This is online gaming. Uh, this is World of Warcraft, a success in the end, you've seen it. These things are, are uh, difficult for designers to make look nice because it's so much data, you've seen this one. Uh, this is another one, this would be another one. This is the population pyramid, this is interesting, this is nice. You filter indicators here and they immediately disappear on the map. It could be more advanced, but that I think is up to end users that say, I want to add my GUI to your, your front end, so to say. Now I'm really suggesting something. <laughs> okay, this is uh, another thing that I found. This is nice, I think. It should move, it's static, that's so boring. Okay, this is the population income distribution. This is bad, I think, somewhere, sometimes it's good, but actually look at Canada. I mean, how big is Canada? It, it's just big on the map. All those islands, so you, you consume pixels. I mean, ne uh, Panama, can you see Panama? No, you can't, it's impossible. So maps, yeah, I like them for traveling and so on, but not for data visualization. Of course it makes sense sometimes, not always. This is cool, this is cool. People will come up with crazy ideas. I, I am not the tufty kind of guy. I think if someone thinks this makes sense, okay. Democracy, that's up to them. I, I, we shouldn't <laughs> limit them, so to say, but they will not be successful because it's, it's very tricky to see if this is, what's the name of the guy? <laughs> okay. This is a poverty map. The size of the country is the number of poor people. So this is India, China. You can't see Europe, you can't see US and Canada. This is actually Latin, uh, uh, Central American Caribbean. This is Haiti. So Central America is as big as Latin America in terms of number of poor. Uh, this also shrinks strange. Some people say these maps are bad. A lot of people say it looks fun, so they will remember it, sort of, and get interested. Let's enable any graphic front end that makes sense for that particular data. Trade data, movement, transport. You need to have some kind of connections. I don't know how to put it. Let's find new ways. This is something else. This is small multiples. I mean, a lot of different indicators combined. This is probably too difficult for a lot of audience. These are the kind, you can see US up there. It's really a strange thing. I didn't do these things. I just pick, pick them. And I, I think it's like uh, nice to see how uh, many different alternatives people come up with. This is the number of AIDS death to there. And then you have the number of infected in HIV and AIDS. And this is the Second World War, the number of deaths. So we're already above uh, the Second World War. And then you have the other wars there. This would be Wikipedia editing visualized, I think. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is where we should go. <laughs> That's more or less what you want me to say? Okay. Anna and me, we are married. Yes, to, to clarify. <laughs> I want to say something. <coughs> the, the, uh, the first thing you showed, the Dollar Street, does that, um, is, does that work on, uh, actually, does it work on the map? No. no. Actually not. Unfortunately. Yeah, Dollar Street doesn't work on a map. And we went to try to find funding for that Dollar Street and, and Save the Children gave us like two months of work. And we managed to make it work on, on Windows. And it was made in Director, Macromedia Director. And it was not the same on Macintosh. Flash would have worked. 
yeah, the plugin uh, is just somewhere. I don't know. That was like four years ago. We are gonna uh, renew it if if we sort of have the money. Okay. More questions. Yep. So, do you believe that there is not an increasing <laughs> income gap in the U.S. between the? I don't know, but. As any, yeah, is there an increasing income gap in US? Do I believe so? I wouldn't answer the question, but in any country, if we look at data, uh, there are the poorest 20%, the richest 20%. Yeah, maybe the difference between those groups are increasing. But the, the word ma gap make you think there are like two bumps. It's not. That's the thing, I mean. I mean, the distance between poorest and richest may increase still. It may, and on a world level, it does. Let me show you. Yeah. Um, if we take this one and we look at the world, this would, the, the gray one would be the world, and we can see... Look at these people, the poorest. They are next to this day, okay? The richest one have somewhere around $100 in 1970. If we move forward, yes, the poor guys remain poor and the rich guys get richer. So, yes, the gap is increasing between the richest and the poor. But the poor don't get poorer because that is dying. You don't get poorer. You can't. On a global level, in US you can get poorer without dying. So if, if the gap is increasing on a world level, it would be the rich getting richer. And that's happened. That's happening, yes it does. And this is on a lo logarithmic scale. So people will claim we are fooling them by saying so. But this is the kind of discussions that high school children should go into with their teachers and starting to combine mathematics and social science to deal with this stuff. That's why I intentionally try to be provocative in some sense for you to start think because I only talk about the general stuff, it wouldn't be interesting, okay? In this graph, you see a hint of a double bump. In the graph that you showed before, you can really see. The second one is smaller. What does it mean? <laughs> Let's look at Brazil. If we see a double, yeah. We see a double bump. Let's look at Brazil. Oh, there is a gap. But this data is modeled. Uh, Xavier Sala Martin, a professor in economics at Columbia University, he say, we can't deal with country averages. It doesn't make sense. We have to have distributions. So I better throw together some distributions for countries based on income surveys. And people will criticize me for modeling the data like this. But I do it anyway, because then they will realize they need to collect this kind of data. So this is like the first attempt, and I, I like this approach, doing it with low quality, yes, to show that we need it. I mean, the first world map was completely wrong, but it showed the need of a world map, and then we just made it more and more perfect over time. But we need to start with bad stuff, so too. So those bumps you see, those are model data. There is a tendency of, of this kind of gaps in Brazil. It, it's even more increased here. But of course, these are multiple normal distributions combined, so to say. Yep. When you had your graph with China, um, with the Mao Zedong, uh, where China got uh, <coughs> better health care, but less, uh, or, or not as, as rich, and then it took a hook to the right. Is that typical? Do people tend to move up and then hook to the right? Or do, are there any instances of people hooking to the left, like getting richer with, with uh, poorer health? <coughs> and then suddenly become healthier. In other words, does the wealth follow the, the better health care, or does the health care follow the wealth? Okay, uh, China is that an exception? First getting healthy, then getting rich. Uh, well, I showed you another example, Sweden. Well, this is, I'm f sorry, yes, this is the same chart on linear scales. This is a big problem we have. We actually need logarithmic scales. A lot of audiences don't understand logarithmic scales. It's, it's really a problem. Well. Sweden moved in the center, you saw. Let's look at US. Where did US go? Actually, I hope I can show it to you. No, actually, I have it. Yeah, no, I, I prepared it. One second. It's nice for you to wait for something for two seconds. US. Ah, oh, this one. This is not nice. It was actually designed for paper printout. So, but you, you, can, you can get the idea. This is where I plotted US, it's in PowerPoint. Uh, 
This is the road of US from 1900. Didn't I say rightish countries on the right? You see, the, right, the, the, the conservative politics all over the world say we should first get rich, then we can invest. The leftish, or whatever you call them, they say let's invest all we have in social welfare. If, like Cuba, this is the track of Cuba. So politics makes sense. Politics can really change where countries are going and the speed of change and so on. Like Iran, the whole drop you saw is based on political decisions. So politis politics do, does really make a lot of sense. That sort of answers your question. There is not one path that countries follow. Really fast development seem to happen, this is my interpretation, not numeric, yes, visually. South Korea moves from here in the 60s to there in the middle of the cloud. Yeah, no, I didn't show you. Sorry, I didn't show you this thing. Let's go back to, to 1870. This is other country with data. As we move forward here, we will see more and more countries. 1900, the First World War, the Second World War. This is the overall movement on Earth in income and health. I take it once again a little bit slower. So those like France and Germany and so on moves up. They are very low down. Remember they were here in the 1800. Now, eight, 1980, 1990, there is white. This is white now. There are no countries with this income in the world, with this low child survival. Why? Because it's much cheaper to produce good health. Today, we have much more knowledge and much more technology, and we know about the vaccines and so on. So this is, these are the kind of things, even the long patterns wouldn't go the same, the same path. Yeah, let's go back to 1970, where everybody in Sweden were communists, more or less. Okay, so they look at the data. If they did, I don't know if they did. They would say, the richest country on earth, are United Arab Emirates, created as soon as they found oil, they said, we need to be a country, you know? So they made a country. No, that, that was, <laughs> I don't know much about United. But that's actually, the, it, it coincident in time. So they are richest in the world, but they didn't have time to build up any social security system. They just found money. So they end up very, very rich with no society, so to say. China is the opposite. They didn't find oil, but they had built up this society over time. So they were as healthy. Let's say they were here. But we don't know exactly. We can't know. For the poor countries here, we don't know exactly where they are. But we need to use that data. Uh, in US and Sweden, every person is counted. Every birth is counted. And with, whether you die, it's counted. And it's, so the data is like more or less 100% sure. In this part of the world, it's based on some few surveys that are extrapolated for the rest of the population. It's like it, the coverage is somewhere around 1% in some countries. I mean, we don't know for sure. So that's a much bigger problem than political manipulation, because that will come back to the, the politicians. Those things are quite, quite famous. I mean, uh, North Korea doesn't show up here, because there, there is no uh, transparency in, in looking at their data, neither the population, nothing. So sort of answers your question, I hope. Yep. So is there any kind of derivative metric which takes into account multiple dimensions and form one number, like quality of life kind of index? Human development index. Yeah, the question is, is there a c c combination of indicators that sort of can, can rank or something? I added some words to your question, sorry. But that is what it's used for, to, to provoke countries like Sweden is number one in human development index. If, if we show up on number two, this is how the UN system works. Every year there is an a AIDS day or poverty day or something. That is just to get attention in the media. That's the way they do it. And that day they should present the ranking of all countries in their indicators. They often combine sort of the, the index. The Human Development Report have the Human Development Index, where you combine GDP per capita, life expectancy, literacy rate, and school enrollment into one index expressed as percentage. So what is 100% GDP per capita? Well, it's Luxembourg, the richest country, and the poorest would be 0%. And then in life expectancy, 
is the Japanese life expectancy of women because it's very is the highest. So they sort of uh, uh, equalize those indicators and come up with an index. Yes, they do. That I would say is not needed anymore. That that kind of approach is very effective if you only have one minute with Tony Blair, for example. You you can say you're number two, or you're number seven. Okay, it's a very fast way of communicating data, but it it. It, it removes all the complexity in the data, so you don't see the distribution. We, we could sort of combine, let me, for the Human Development Index, if we take the life expectancy here, on a linear scale, imagine making an index saying that that one is the best performer, rich and healthy, this one is worse, this would be the lowest ranking, the highest ranking. And then the other ones would be something like this. You mean this one and that one would actually have the same ranking because it's mixed. So you don't see the difference between Botswana and some Slovakia or something. It wouldn't be Slovakia, sorry. <coughs> Armenia. These two would sort of have the same, because this one is rich and unhealthy, that one is healthy and unrich. <laughs> uh, okay. Yep. Actually, you had yeah, a yeah, chance yeah. before. Uh, we got to be working and trying to uh, combine quantitative data with quantitative. So, for example, and associate with, with the numbers here, news stories or articles. Right. Yeah, we added, yeah, the question is, did we add any qualitative data uh, together with numeric data? Uh, yes, that is when it starts to make sense. That's, let's call it statistics storytelling or something. That is the qualitative part is to tell what happened here, uh, what kind of politics do we have. That's exactly the kind of words I've been adding all the time. Without these words, it wouldn't make sense. It would just be like, what is this? So that is a tricky thing if you want to automate this process to sort of generate meaningful charts. It, it, it is very useful to have the comments and mix it with other historic events like worldhistory.com. You have timelines of what happened in countries at every point. But uh, yeah. So that's the question of uh, uh, overlaying events with, with uh, numeric data on objective criteria. Is there also a way, and you looked at um, the relationship between the, the objective uh, health and, and economic measures, the subjective quality of life? Subjective, so, objective, yeah. Uh, there is a, a world of data out there. People, some people collect indicators. There is a world value survey that actually asks people, are you happy? And they cover some, uh, I don't know, 80 countries. It makes a lot of sense to ask these questions, and it's very interesting to look at their results. I could show you things from there. Uh, but if, if they can sort of convert those qualitative aspects into numbers, it's easier to compare it with GDP per capita. Yeah, they, that's, they are doing a great job. And their data is free. A lot of these university projects, those are free. And UNICEF have a project uh, uh, and some uh, DHS and MIX. There are two survey projects asking a lot of poor countries how they are. This data is free. So there is free data. It's often survey data. It's like the academic community. Yes, they give away their raw numbers, the really survey answers, so you can model them yourself. That kind of things exist. Yep. I think a lot of people have other meetings to attend, so it's just switch to a different mode where um, if you want to stay and talk to, uh, to this group, that's great.